Good evening, passengers. We are on our final approach to the electric grid, where your host, Michael Parker, will be joining you shortly. For the remainder of the flight, we ask that you keep your arms and legs inside the craft and your mind open, as we will encounter the turbulence of new ideas and fresh perspectives. If at any time the alternative viewpoints you absorb while inside the pyramid become too distressing, simply say to yourself, I'm happy. It's like a tomb without a roof. Good day. Greetings, truth seekers, paradigm busters, new world order, civil disobedience, freedom fighters, free thinkers, higher mammals, good people of all types. How's it going? My name is Michael Parker, and welcome to episode five of the Electric Pyramid. Coming to you, as always, from an undisclosed location somewhere in Hollywood, California. It is Thursday, June 26th, for all of us on the West Coast. It is already Friday the 27th, for those of you on the East Coast. And uh, we'd like to say hello to our uh, our producer, Joe Kiernan. How are you doing, brother? Doing well, doing excellent. Everything's fantastic here on the East Coast. How are you doing out there, my man? Uh, not bad. This is uh, this is uh, episode five. We're just, we're just moving right along. How fast was that? I like it. I yeah, like it a lot. Too. You it's guys doing well, man. You're doing you're doing a great job. These shows are fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I'm enjoying it. And uh, you guys tonight, because of the sheer magnitude of the information that we're going to be diving into, I'm not going to dazzle you with my usual uh, witty antidotes or news stories of the week, because we are going to be talking about something tonight that I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around a lot of just bad information a lot of disinformation and that is freemasonry a lot of people will think uh, if they even think about it at all they're like what what are freemasons is that something out of that dan brown novel or, or is is this is this the illuminati is this the oto are these devil worshipers what what do these people stand for and and what what are they doing and we why are their symbols on our money so it's it's going to be a chance for us to dispel some myths i believe about what the freemasons really are and our speaker tonight is a gentleman named robert w sullivan the fourth and he's written a magnificent piece of work. Uh, this new book is The Royal Arch of Enoch. We're going to be discussing that. I know he was on your show a few weeks ago, Joe. Oh, yeah. I listened to that and uh, it was really great stuff. Yeah, he's uh, he's a uh, scholar and a gentleman, no doubt. Uh, he's uh, well well read, well versed. And, uh, he's, a, he's a student of the craft and, uh, and, and, and I'm grateful for people like him uh, that, that speak out as opposed to just saying, uh, let people think what they want. And he he tries to make a very difficult understanding uh, presentable. He tries to make it presentable, and I think he does a very good job. Yes, I'm reading his book right now. It's it's actually it's one heck of a piece of work here. I mean, this is you know 600, 700 pages. The full title is "The Royal Arch of Enoch: The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism." So we're going to be discussing that for most of the first hour, and then in the second hour, we're going to talk about something that he's also got a new book on, and that is esoteric symbolism in movies. And I'm interested to ask him some questions because. I know from his discussion that I heard him do with you, he addressed a lot of movies that I was actually kind of surprised about. But I want to ask him if popular culture is hijacking some of their symbols out from under them. And uh, so that's just one of the things we're going to be talking about in the second hour. Let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Sullivan. Robert W. Sullivan IV is a philosopher, a historian, an antiquarian, a jurist, a theologian, writer, and a lawyer. The Royal Arch of Enoch is the first published book and is the result of 20 years of research. Mr. Sullivan received his BA from Gettysburg College in 1995, having spent his entire junior year studying European history at St. Catherine's College, Oxford University. He received his JD from Widener University, that's Delaware campus in 2000. He studied international law and jurisprudence at Trinity College, Oxford University. Mr. Sullivan is a Freemason, having joined Amicable St. John's Lodge Number no. 25, Baltimore, Maryland in 1997. 
He became a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason in 1999, Valley of Baltimore, Orient of Maryland. He is a lifelong Marylander and resides in Baltimore. So uh, I think before, uh, before we go on any further, let's uh, just try to get Robert on the line. Got a deal. So uh, Robert Sullivan's going to be joining us shortly. Here we go. Oh, hello. Robert? Yes. Greetings. This is Michael Parker with the Electric Pyramid. How are you? I'm very well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Hello, great. Robert. This is Joe Kiernan. How are you? Uh, hey, Joe. How are you doing? Very well. Nice to hear you again. Yeah, great to be back. Uh, I certainly appreciate the invite for uh, Electric Pyramid. Great to be on. Well, you're welcome. We're glad you were able to stay up late with us tonight. I know this is late for you guys on the on the East Coast, so I appreciate that very much. And Robert, I've got to say, man, I'm reading your book right now. It's a magnificent piece of work, and I'm I'm very impressed. Well, thank you very much. I, I you know, it was 20 years of... Hello? I think we may have lost Robert. Yeah, bear with me here. Ladies and gentlemen, we're working on Skype technology, so sometimes... Things don't go as exactly as planned. I think it's the old mice and men type of thing here, but we will get <laughs> it right back. He might be so, having some storms. I can, so. I can hear you. Oh, can you? Oh, you can. I do. Yeah, I, I'm still here. Fine now. Oh, sorry. We we thought fine. we lost you there for a second. You were discussing 20 years, and then it just kind of uh, faded uh, out. Faded out. But you I, were I you 20 years of work. Though. Yeah. No, I, I, you're coming in fine on uh, my end. I hope I'm coming in okay where you guys are. Now you are. Okay. No, yeah, uh, the Royal Arch of Enoch, um, that started back in 1992-93. Um, yeah, it's like my magnum opus, and uh, it's 20 years of research and writing, and um, been out now, good grief, almost two years, hard to believe. But, um, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm real happy with the way it came out, and um, the, po the, the feedback on it, the reviews have been, you know, pretty much positive, so um, I can't complain there. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, you're getting a lot of interviews. There's a lot of interest in this. And are you surprised or did you kind of expect it to go this way? Well, I, you know, you kind of hope it goes that way. I, I thought the book, um, I did believe the book was special, um, but I guess probably a lot of authors say that about their material. But I, I did believe that the book was unique um, in the fact that um, it, it does present this historical anomaly for the first time. So anytime you're saying something new, um, for the first time, that's definitely, you know, kind of an attention grabber. And then what I was really able to do was twine that with just like a lot of the history of, the, of Freemasonry coming out of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment. Then I carried it forward into the United States with, you know, the, the development of the United States being based upon this, uh, being based on, um, on Masonry, both Blue Lodge and High Degree. Um, and, and the architecture of things like Washington and Baltimore and, um, you know, some of the stuff going on in New York City and then, you know, and finally ending up on the, I concluded the uh, Royal Arch with the movie, uh, some of the movies with the Masonic, Enochian, and solar, you know, symbolism in it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I'm real happy with the way it's been received. It's, it's had its naysayers. Um, I expected that as well. Um, but overall, I mean, you know, you know, easily I could say 99, 95% of the feedback on it has been um, overwhelmingly positive. That's great to hear. Let me ask you this. How do your brothers in the crowd feel about it? How, have, they, have they felt in any way that they were nervous or, or have they been positive towards it? Um, I've gotten both. Um, mo most is positive. Um, the, 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 it has encountered some resistance, unfortunately. Um, and the resistance that, that, um, that came didn't come from a portion of the book that I thought it would. Um, oh, by and large, most of the Masons and, and, and Masonic feedback on it has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, there was a little, um, there, it has, I have gotten some feedback, uh, some of the negative pieces on it was, um, some people, some Masons thought I gave away too much stuff. I disagree with that. Um, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think I violated anything. Um, you know, pertaining to like a Masonic oath or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, there was, and, and I don't back off of this, um, when, I, when I wrote it, when, when I was putting it out, I originally thought that some of the material in Chapter 3 
um, was going to be, a, you know, you know, was maybe going to upset some some people sure. and some masons and things like that. It really hasn't. Um, some of the stuff, the, 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 one of the more things that I guess I've been criticized over was the concept of masonry um, preserving this sort of antediluvian Enochian wisdom, um, which you know does come out of the royal arts ceremonial, and of course. The, the origins of this wisdom, you know, definitely hinge on this group of fallen angels known as the Watchers. So, yes. it, you know, it, it flirts with sort of this demonic, um, you know, aspect of it, although in the Book of Enoch, it's not demonic at all. But I have gotten a little criticism for that, although it, it is clearly in the ritual and it's in the monitors and things like that. So I'm kind of like, I'm just bringing, it, bringing something to light that's already there. Um, but, but no, um, over, overall, I mean, I would definitely say to you, um, the, the feedback one, I would say, has easily been 90 to 95 percent positive. But I, I've encountered some naysayers about it. Um, but again, that, that I, I fully expected. That comes with the territory. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, you know when, when, it, I, when it comes to, like, you know, talking about masonry, I should just point this out um, for, for your listeners. Um, really, if you read other books by Masons and, and books about Masonic symbolism written by Freemasons, they all say the same thing, and mine does too, is really they, they don't want you giving away things like the handshakes, the passwords, sure. the pass grips, um, and I don't really do any of that. Um, certainly the symbolism, the philosophies, the, the symbolic interpretations, that's all fair game. But, um, you know, I, you know there's, been, there's a couple times in the book where I might have to write down a secret word or something like that, and I just write the initials down. That's really as close as I get to it. The, mm -hmm. the, truth, the, the, the truth be told, Mike, I mean, you know, in 2014, a, a routine Google search will reveal, reveal this stuff anyway. But I Agreed. don't put it in the book. Yeah. So. Well, I have been inundating myself with as much Freemasonry kind of knowledge as I could within the last two weeks in preparation for the show, and I, like many others, you know, if you dabble in the types of subjects that most people probably dabble in if they're listening to this radio show last night, they probably have an image of masonry that, that is not correct and is based upon, you know, what they've seen in pop culture, what they've seen on conspiracy theory websites or what have you. And in reading your book and listening to many of your interviews and uh, just watching a lot of videos over the last couple of weeks, what I've discovered about uh, masonry is I actually, I'm quite impressed by it. Not that I was, didn't think that I wasn't going to be, but it's not nearly, let's, let's be honest here. You guys kind of have a bit of a spooky reputation. I mean, people don't know exactly if they're not, Freemasons, they don't know exactly what you guys do, and when they read a Dan Brown novel or they see something like that, they think they lump you in with the Illuminati or uh, in many other kind of shadowy groups, which they've also probably got incomplete uh, information about. So tonight we're going to try to maybe dispel some myths, and uh, you're going to be able to educate some people. So to that end, I want to kind of start at the beginning before we ramp up a little bit. And in your particular case, Robert, you are a Freemason. You're a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason. Now, to almost anyone, I think that would sound very impressive and Perhaps to some people it sounds even mysterious. What do those titles mean, and what is the structure for achieving that? Right. Um, to, 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 the first thing in masonry that you have to do um, in order to become a Freemason or, or what, or you know, to hold yourself out as a Freemason, is you have to join what's called the Blue Lodge, mm -hmm. um, and th th this is a local lodge um, of, of, of Freemasons. These are in every state. They're, they're, they're all, you know, they're, they're on the street corner of every state. There's a grand lodge in every state, um, that monitors the activities of the blue lodge. Um, um, the, the, there is no universal grand lodge of the United States. Each state it runs its own jurisdiction. So I'm, I'm on the East coast, as you pointed out, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. So I'm under the aegis of this grand lodge of Maryland. If you were in New York, it would be the grand lodge of New York, Pennsylvania, Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania in California, where you are, be the Grand Lodge of California. Um, you, it, you, to, to join, you have to petition a lodge. Um, you fill out an application. There's an application fee if you get accepted. Um, and basically, unless unless you know you have some you know real criminal background or or, or 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 you just you know come off as a total you know whack job or something. I mean, if you say you know if they interview and say why are you joining, you say well I want to you know join a cabal to take over the world. That's not going <laughs> to yeah you know that's not going to go well. It's, it's the truth. I mean, it's not going to go over very well. Although right. I will say this. 
that there is definitely a swing towards the more esoteric side. I mean, look, the truth of the matter is, when I joined back in the late 90s, and, and up until then, most people, myself included, were, were joining, you know, and the, the answer was it's just a broken record, family tradition or, you know, community activity. I mean, that's why I joined. I come from, from a long line of Maryland Masons, mm-hmm. grandfathers and great-grandfathers and so on and so forth. That pendulum is swinging, though, where, there's definitely a more, in, you know, interest in the esoteric, you know, and I dare say at the occult side of things. Sure. But anyway, getting, yeah, getting back to the question, once, once you petition, you get accepted, you go through three degrees of masonry, entered apprentice, fellow craft, master mason, you, it, the rituals. After you do the ritual, and this, this varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, you have to do what's called a catechism. So after you do the entered apprentice ritual and you go through it, um, you, you have to, mem- at least I did, I, I know it varies from jurisdiction to the jurisdiction, memorize um, a series of questions and answers, and it's not written down. You have to learn it orally, and it's very difficult. Um, but but what, then, then once you, 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 you go in front of the lodge and you do the catechism, then you get the fellow craft degree, and you do the same thing again. You get, you get like two, three months off to learn this new catechism. Go through that. Then you do the master mason degree. Uh, and then you do a catechism for that, and then after that's over, you are a free, you know, you are the third degree master mason. You can hold yourself out as a master mason. Once that is accomplished, um, at that point, um, you can do one of a couple things. You can you can do nothing um, and just stay in the blue lodge and go no further, and that's completely fine, and that's up to you. Uh, there, there's two high degree bodies that are opened up to you once you become the third degree master mason, um, and they are called the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. Um, the the Scottish Rite um, they, they they are both born out of what is called the Rite of Perfection, which came out of Paris, France in the 1740s. Um, the the Scottish Rite was set up in 1801. The York Rite was set up. Um, in the early 19th century um, by a man basically named Thomas Smith Webb um, who reworks a lot of the rites, the rituals in the Rite of Perfection. Um, you, you can join both of these rites. They're not mutually exclusive. You can join neither of them um, or, you know, some people just pick and choose. I, I did the Scottish Rite because that's where my family went into was the Scottish mm-hmm. Rite. So I, I did that. Um, you, and it's the same sort of thing. You petition, you know, you know, in, in, in the, the Scottish Rite, they have what are called orients. So there's like a state orient. So I'd be in the orient of Maryland. And then where you are in the state, you have what's called valleys. So I'm in the valley of Baltimore, but there'd be valleys of different parts, like, a, you know, valley of uh, western Maryland or something like that. Um, and, and you sign up. And, and the, 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 the Scottish Rite is a little different because it's not different. In the Blue Lodge, the rituals are participatory, um, you know, where you are actually, you know, going through the ritual. In the Scottish Rite, it's more of you sit in an audience and watch basically a series of morality plays and plays based on Judaic Christianity and mysteries of the Bible. You're basically just watching, you know, like like a, a stage production almost. There are portions of it that become interactive, but it's it's basically you're watching... Um, plays being interacted, and you go up, and then, you know, you you do that, and you become a thirty second degree. That that's really where it ends. Um, that's the final degree in the Scottish Rite. The York Rite ends um, with what is called the Knights uh, Templar, um, and that's separate yes. from the rest of Masonry because that requires a Christian confession to join it. It's the it's the only body of Masonry that re- actually requires a religious confession to join. Um, but from in my case, in the Scottish Rite, I'm the thirty second. The only degree that's higher than that is the 33rd, but that's honorary. That, that cannot be solicited. That has to be bestowed upon you, and it's usually, it's usually given for people who are very active in the community, politicians, celebrities, uh, captains of industry, um, things like that. So I'm at the 32nd, and um, you know, you know, it, 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 would, it wouldn't be my, my decision to make if I'd have to basically be invited to become a 33rd. Um, and that's where that's it. You know, that's how you uh, you know pro- progress in masonry. There are other Masonic bodies out there. Once once you become a um, a third degree, that you know are, are you know you know the Scottish Rite and the York Rite. I mean, to be honest, they're the two most popular ones. Right. But there are things like the Shriners, Yed yes. Grotto. These are other Masonic um, you know bodies and organizations that you can you know certainly uh, join after becoming a uh, third degree Master Mason. I get it. So let me ask you one other thing about the 33rd degree. So you're saying that is 
it has to be bestowed upon you as an honorary situation. So you cannot strive to achieve that. It is, I guess you're nominated for that by the lodge itself or, or who, who is the, the body then that decides to, to bestow that upon you? Well, it would probably be, um, it would probably be in conjunction with the grant, with the, uh, mother, you know, council of the world, which is in Washington, DC, but it would also be a lot of input from the local Valley. So for me, it would be in Baltimore. So if, you know, if I became well known in Baltimore and was doing charity work or whatever, or, or became a celebrity, you know, it would, it would probably, the, 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 the colonel would start in the Baltimore Valley. Um, and then it would progress probably to Washington. Um, and, you know, it would probably be, um, you, you know, a lot of the, uh, grand command, you know, with the grand commander or a lot of the people who are the higher ups in the, in the Maryland Scottish right. Um, it would, it would be a decision made by them. But again, it, it, you know, it, it's up to them. They, they, they decide who, who gets in, you know, who gets it. it, it you, the, the only way I could say that you can try to do it is, you know, is, is if you're, is if, you know, you become, you know, like I said, somewhat of a celebrity, sure. well known in the community. But, but, but by and large, the decision is not yours. Um, you, you basically would just wake up one morning and a letter would be, in, you know, would be in your mailbox saying, you know, you know, after consideration, you know, and based on your, you know, commitment to the community and this, that, and the other, you know, we've decided to bestow the 33rd upon you. You know, we're going to have a ceremony, you know, in the Baltimore Valley on X date, be there, and, you know, you'll get the 33rd degree, basically. I believe, I hope this wasn't just a rumor, but I believe that James Cameron was bestowed, was his 33rd degree. Is that correct? I mean, did they give him that, I believe, before he got an award for Titanic or something, or is that just wives' tale? I have no idea. Um, I know that there are a lot of, I, I think I've been asked about him before. I know there are a lot of Masons in Hollywood, mm -hmm. um, but I do not know of Cameron's, James Cameron's membership. I, I couldn't even tell you if he was a Freemason or if he was in the Scottish Rite or even if he was a 33rd. I, I, that's something that's something I'd have to go look up. But um, I, I have I have no knowledge of um, James Cameron's membership in uh, Freemasonry. I mean, I, I can tell you... Um, some actors and you know right right off the top i know that um richard dreyfus is in the scottish right i don't know if he's a 33rd but i know he's um in the scottish right um uh, you know a lot of the golden age hollywood people sure. like um, douglas fairbanks um were um uh, the the actor um uh, uh, what's his name oh, it's escaping me I, uh, peter sellers was a freemason sure. um but um I know, um, I know Richard Dreyfus in, in the, in the Scottish Rite publication, they'll occasionally put pictures of the celebrities, you know, in their, you know, Scottish Rite uniform, the hat, the apron. And, um, I know I just saw one with Richard Dreyfus, Cameron's membership though. I couldn't, I couldn't vouch for. No problem. I didn't, I didn't want to get you too off subject on that. I, I just happened to think of that while we were talking about this. Mm -hmm. Um, the core of your book is about this particular higher ritual. And the mystery of the knowledge of that ritual, how, how you guys could have come to have it. And that ritual uh, is the Royal Arch of Enoch. So I think it's fundamental that if we could explain for those who may not know, um, who, first of all, who is Enoch? Right. Um, yeah, it, 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 I think I understand where you're going with the question. Um, basically, just, just for starters, um, Enoch is one of two people in the Bible to never experience a physical death. Um, the prophet Elijah is the other. They are both basically escorted into heaven in corporeal form. Um, and being that, they, they never experience um, a physical death. In the book of Revelation, the final chapter of the New Testament, or the, the final uh, book of the New Testament, um, you're talking about two witnesses to Revelation, that's Enoch and Elijah. Those are the two witnesses, because they've never died, so they're still around, basically. Um, he, 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 Enoch, um, it's a, his name in Hebrew means the initiate, or the initiated one, or just simply initiate. And um, what the book of Enoch talks about is he's, he's mentioned in the Bible, but only in, in one portion very briefly. It's a Genesis 5, 18 to 24. And he's also very briefly mentioned at Jude 14, 15. Um, and all it just basically says there is Enoch was basically taken up into heaven, and that's, that's all it is. And you also have a solar reference with Enoch. Um, it's told that his days on earth were 365 years. 365 is an obvious reference to the solar calendar. Yes. Um, what the Book of Enoch does, or, or One Enoch, which dates to around the Second Temple period, so we're talking, 
you know, 300, 350 B.C., um, it talks about when Enoch got into heaven, what he saw, what he did, you know, and, you know, you know what happened, you know, basically his afterworld experiences mm -hmm. is what the book of Enoch um, describes. It has a lot of um, astrolog. It's very mystical. It's very arcane. You have an astronomy book, astrology book. You, you got elements of, you know, demons of, that he's interacting with, this group called the Watchers yes. that have displeased God. Um, from coming down, you know, the, 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 that's the group that's come down to Earth and had sex with the Earth women to produce yes. this race called the Nephilim, this, right. these giants that run around. But um, the Book of Enoch talks about all this. Make a long story real short. It's off the um, history pages in Western civilization from around 2, 3 um, A.D. Common Era up until 1773 when a man named James Bruce returns to Ethiopia with a couple copies um, of one Enoch or Ethiopian Ethiopic Enoch is what it's usually called, um, and even then it's just deposited in the basement of the Bodleian Library at Oxford until 1821. Um, but what my book talks about, and it's really the thrust of the book, is that this particular high degree ritual known as the Royal Arch of Enoch, as you correctly said, um, is incorporating elements of one Enoch um, as early as the 1740s. So you know how can this be? Um, right. And what I propose is that. These guys who are creating this ritual clearly had, must have had a copy of this unknown to history, at the very least a highly detailed summary of this, because the ritual parallels um, the Book of Enoch, where the, I mean, it's a long story, I mean, it's a 700-page book, but you have concepts of divine kingship, um, of the restoration of this antediluvian wisdom, of the mm -hmm. beholding of the Kabbalah, which is the Tetragrammaton or the name of God. So yeah, you'll definitely see this included in. It's a genuine historical mystery, um, and it's really the crux of the uh, of the book. It's it's really the the thrust of it, I should say. Absolutely, amongst amongst your 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 brothers in the craft. I mean, is this something that you guys talk about quite a bit? Because the, I I was not aware that there was a ritual based on this information that should have been not in existence at that time. Is this a common subject amongst Masons? Or, or was this just something that you were like, hmm, I, I need to look into this? How did this come about? Oh, no, about? no, no, no. This was, uh, this was, this book is the first book to talk about this. Um, prior to this book coming out, this was unknown. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you know, the rituals named after the guy. Um, right. It's called the Royal Arch of Enoch, and you know you you read you go through the ritual and you take a look at it, and and you'll see, you know you you read a um, one of the tip offs, one of the early tip offs for me for this was this book. Um, it's in the bibliography of the Royal Arch. It's a book by a man named B. E. Jones. Um, the B stands for Bernard Bernard E. Jones, and he, and he he wrote a book called the Freemasons Book of the Royal Arch, mm -hmm. and he talks about in the introduction of the book he says. Um, he, he said, you know, I was in this lecture in London, and he said, uh, and, and uh, this, this mystical Freemason named A.E. Waite, um, who was a Mason, he was also a member of this group called the Golden Dawn, he was giving a lecture um, and was talking about how this ritual was, you know, you know a, Waite had kind of, you know, you know, was making sort of this thing saying that the Book of Enoch was influencing this ritual, um, this royal arch ritual, but, but that's where Jones stops. Um, that's all he says. He says, you know, the, you know, you know, the, the Book of Enoch is influencing the development of this higher degree ritual called the Royal Arch of Enoch. The rest of the Jones book is just about the various, the, the variations in the ritual, like in the American version, in the German version, in the Irish version, in the English version. Jones doesn't get into anything about the Book of Enoch being lost to history. So at that point for me, when I discovered that the Book of Enoch was off the history pages at that point, then you begin to think, well, what's going on here? You know, you, right. you have clearly this anomaly going on. And um, like I said, it's 20 years of research in a 700-page book, and um, it's really the first of its kind to, to present this material. Well, it's a phenomenal piece of work. Now, the, the, this, this ritual is the 13th degree, and this is in the Scottish Rite. And then in the York Rite, it's the 7th degree? Correct. Well, that, and, that's and, right. And Go let ahead. me ask you, if, if I understand this correctly— there is a, a similar right in the OTO that to this, which is the fourth right. Is that right? Yeah, the the OTO does does it um, does a does a fourth degree um, a royal arch type of ritual. 
Um, and also the Odd Fellows do a Royal Arch styled ritual called the Royal okay. Arch of Titus. Um, but the 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 original the original Royal Arch ceremonial um, is born in the 1740s. Um, this is pre Odd Fellows, pre OTO, um, mm -hmm. and th this is being cultivated. I mean, we, you know, when you start piecing this together, you you can clearly see. I mean, the picture becomes you know much more obvious as to what's going on here. Um, what, what you you know, I'm just going to backpedal just for a second here. Certainly. Um, what, what you have going on is Freemasonry, the Blue Lodge. These first three degrees are are brought together in England on June 24th in 1717, where this is really the creation of modern day Freemasonry um, in England and London. And this is the first three degrees. Well, Masonry in England re really becomes popular. Um, I mean, it really grows rapidly. The higher degree system. You know, this right of perfection that comes in the 1740s. Um, and, you know, th this is sort of a topic that can upset some people. It turns off some Freemasons. It should not at all. Um, the, the original right of perfection, um, which incorporates this royal arch ceremonial, it's the 13th in the original right of perfection. As you correctly said, it's the 13th in the Scottish right. It turns up in the 7th as the 7th in the York right. Um, this is being developed by the Jesuits in, in Paris, France, um, at a place called the College of Clermont. And, and why they're doing this is it's the Counter-Reformation. Um, it's basically, after the Council of Trent, the Jesuits were basically charged with the total annihilation of England um, by hook or by crook. They wanted to destroy the English monarchy. They wanted to use subterfuge to undermine English society. So you have Freemasonry growing in England. So what, you know, you know well, let's infiltrate this. So what, mm -hmm. what the Jesuits were able to do is cultivate these higher degrees. And I believe that this is, you know, that, that someone, you know, while this was going on, had access to this book. Um, and I've been asked before, well, where could it have come from? And I can get into that if you want to. But at any rate, the Jesuits are, are cultivating this as part of the Counter-Reformation. Um, the higher degrees become very popular on the continent of Europe. They do not take off in London um, for the obvious reason, because they associate with French and the Jesuits, who are the two sworn en enemies of the English. Understood. Um, yeah, but, but the high degrees, um, they become very popular. Um, they're basically, the, what they're trying to do is they're trying to use these higher degrees as a vehicle to restore the Catholic side of the Stuart monarchy back to the throne of England in violation of the Settlement Act of 1701. But at any rate, the, the degrees become very popular and they're eventually midwifed into the, the United States. A man in Albany, New York named Henry Franken sets up a right of perfection lodge in the, I want to say in the 1750s. Um, and he publishes a monitor of these degrees. Um, and this is what ultimately births the Scottish Rite and the York Rite in the United States. Wow. You mentioned the Jesuits, and I, I want to return to them at some point. I don't want to get us too far off, but mm. um, the, the Jesuits and the Illuminati, I want to touch on that shortly. But sure. before, we get, before we get there, you mentioned that people ask you, and, and it is the obvious question, then where did the Freemasons and, and the people who created this particular rite, how did, how did they have the Book of Enoch? How did they have this material? You said you've been asked that before. Right. The, 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 it's a great question. And, and the, the, the evidence points in one direction and one direction only. Um, and, 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 the, and it's actually it's very astonishing um, to, to think that there was a copy of the Book of Enoch or one Enoch in Europe um, prior to Bruce returning from Ethiopia with these four copies that we mentioned earlier, you know, were mm -hmm. put in the bodily and not deposited, you know, or deposited, not translated to 1821. So who could have had a copy of this thing? Um, the, the answer, the, the, it points in one person and one person only, and that's a man who was Queen Elizabeth's court astrologer named Dr. John D. Um, he is by far and away the most likely candidate for possessing a copy of the Book of Enoch. Um, where he got it from is anyone's guess, but the, the, the evidence is very compelling um, for D. W w one is, and just on, a, just on a base, you know, just on a simple thing, if I was presenting it in court, this is the arguments I would craft, is one is he, at the time, he had the largest library of, in, in Europe. Um, I mean, his library was extensive. So, you know, to suggest that he would have had, he, you know, that he could have had a copy is not beyond reason. Number right. two. I wouldn't be shocked at all. No. Number two is he, of course, cultivates this magical system. And what's it called? You know, Enochian. This is the language of the angels. This is the language of the demons. Well, why is D naming this 
magic after this biblical patriarch. He must have known something. You know, he must have known that in the Book of Enoch, there is this interaction with the archangels and the watchers, these, these fallen angels, these demons. You know, why is he naming his magical system Enochian? Well, and the answer is because he had a copy of the Book of Enoch. But perhaps the most third, and this is by far and away the most compelling reason is, because he was um, one of Sir Francis Walsingham's spies. Um, Walsingham had created a spy ring to protect Queen Elizabeth from assassination, and pe people who were involved with the spy ring was Dot John Dee, Francis Drake, Walter Raleigh, Giordano Bruno. These guys all were under the aegis of Walsingham, and Edward Kelly as well. And in and one of these, you know, you know, henchmen or whatever in this group is Walter Raleigh. Walter Raleigh um, publishes a book called The History of the World, and in The History of the World, Raleigh actually mentions that the Book of Enoch contains an astronomy book, and Raleigh basically says that the astronomy book, at least, at least the Book of Enoch, and at least this portion must have belonged to the Church Fathers, Origen or Tertullian. Well, historians have always said, if you read Origen and Tertullian, there's no evidence of this, but that's not the right question to ask. The right question to ask is, how in the hell did Sir Walter Raleigh know that there's an astronomy book in the, in the Book of Enoch when the book's lost to history? Right, and the answer is, is obvious. It's because he's getting it from D. I mean, that, you know, it, yeah. that's the only answer that you, know, you can come up with. So, yeah, I mean, to me, D, D is the most likely candidate for a source copy of the Book of Enoch floating around Europe prior to uh, Bruce coming back back uh, from Ethiopia. You know, Robert, I'm only going to suggest this because I know you know uh, Giordano Bruno very well also. Is you, any consideration to Bruno bringing that book there? Because I know he basically arrived in Queen Elizabeth's court with just a donkey full of books. You know? Yeah, it's, it, it's certainly possible. I mean, cl clearly, cl you know, where do, you know, then, then the question begets, where did D get it from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Br Bruno, Bruno could have been potentially a source. Um, I, I couldn't speculate. Yeah, of course um, not. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, I couldn't speculate where D, D got it from. But D, death to me, I wouldn't definitely. I would not be shocked at all. John, John no. D, he was in the center of everything at that moment. No, I totally agree with that. And, um, you know, you know, then you get into this concept of, you know, is, is this, you know, is this potentially, you know, you talk about Bruno, you know, then you go back, you know, with these Rosicrucian circles, the Cathars, the Templars, you know, is this something maybe the Templars brought back from the Holy Land mm -hmm. and it fell into the hands of the Rosicrucians or something like that? And this is where D got it from. I mean, that's all very possible. Robert, when I hear you describing the situation, it, it almost makes me think there may have even been other copies of the book. I mean, if there was four coming back from Ethiopia, um, somebody obviously had one in the vicinity of the people that we're discussing. It, it's possible that there were other copies of it floating around. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's absolutely possible. Um, another likely, you know, an another likely, um, you know, explanation is the Vatican archives. You know, yeah. certainly you have the Jesuits putting this together. You know, well, you know, you know, if if a, if a copy didn't fall into their hands from D, um, you know, you know, well, where else could it have come from? Well, the Vatican archives are, is certainly a possible explanation. Um, these works falling into the hands of the Jesuits, though, is not um, unprecedented. Believe it or not. Um, the, the there is in Yale University a a alchemical occult manuscript known as the Voynich manuscript. Yes. Um, yeah, and and this this is allegedly um, the, the, it, it's not proven, but there is strong suggestion that this this document was at least belonged to John D or was at least drafted by by him in part. Um, that there is evidence to suggest that some of the handwriting. On, on some of the pages is D's beyond dispute. Um, this would not surprise me. Um, the Voynich manuscript actually belonged to a, a Jesuit mystic named Athanathus Kircher, who was this Jesuit hermeticist. So the the idea of these works falling into the hands of the Society of Jesus, uh, uh, the Society of Jesus, um, is not alarming. Um, it's not. It wouldn't surprise me in the least. But certainly, um, the Vatican archives would be, you know, another likely uh, source, source, uh, primary source for a potential one Enoch. Well, one of the things that has intrigued me uh, between reading your book and listening to a lot of your interviews is this idea about the Jesuits. Um, I don't remember who said it. Maybe you said it, but. 
they're almost kind of like the CIA back in oh, the day. Absolutely. And it's, these guys are like full on intelligence and shadowy figures. And, and now we have a Pope who's a Jesuit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've got Pope Francis the first, the uh, first Jesuit Pope, um, you know, and he seems to be relaxing a lot of the uh, old Catholic doctrines. I'm not sure what his right. motivations for this are just yet, but um, certainly interesting. But yeah, when 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 the when the pe people when people think of the Society of Jesus, they think of them in the 20th century, 21st century terms. Right. This this is this is the wrong way to think of them. When, <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's okay to think. I mean, they're they're like that now. I mean, it's right. like Freemasonry. You know, their power was substantially undercut from them. But when when Ignatius Loyola um, founded the society back in the 1500s. Um, and he was modeling it after the priesthoods of Egypt, um, the, the mystical priesthoods of Egypt. Certainly there was a Templar influence on Ignatius of Loyola, the concept of the warrior mystic priest, the warrior mystic monk. Um, but then after the Council of Trent, um, where you have the Jesuits charged with the Counter-Reformation, you know, this is where they really turn into this sort of CIA Vatican style you know, organization where you have them using subterfuge, you know, any means necessary. I mean, their old arch enemy was England. You know, the, you know, they always wanted to just get back at England for, for mm -hmm. you know, Henry VIII tossing out mm -hmm. the Vatican um, and establishing the Church of England. You have the uh, 1588 Spanish Armada where they went after Queen Elizabeth. Um, this was a Jesuit operation. The, the Guy Fox uh, gunpowder plot of 1605 where they were trying to blow up the yes. English Parliament, that, that's a Jesuit operation. Um, and then, of course, you've got, you know, well, we got Freemasonry in England becoming very popular. Let's try to undermine that with these, quote, unquote, Roman Catholic styled higher degrees. You know, this is, you know, the, the Counter-Reformation was the Jesuits' uh, modus operandi. They were so, you know, it got so out of hand that the Pope put the, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, the Pope put the Jesuits out of business in 1773, 1774, um, you know, for, for, for their political meddlings. You've, you know, you've got the writings of Kircher running around talking about the occult, talking about how Christianity is just the Egyptian religion with new names applied to it. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus is Horus. You know, the Virgin Mary is the Virgin Isis. Kircher was very open about all this. So, you know, the Pope had had enough of these uh, guys by 1774. They're suppressed. Oh, and then what do we have two years later? The Illuminati turns up. Exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, and that, uh, here we go again with the counter, you know, just, it's just the Jesuits under another name. And I was not aware of that until I, I started doing the research for this show. And it makes sense, um, but it surprised me. Yeah, it, it is surprising. Um, you know, you you know, again, you know, when it comes to these um, spy agencies and the Counter Reformation, the Jesuits would say one thing and do another, and that's exactly what you have with the Illuminati. You've got this, you know, guys like Weishaupt, Xavier, yeah. you know, Xavier Zwack running around talking about ending religion, ending, you know, ending all governments, creating this one world government, you know, that, that, that the religion, that the, the only thing that we're going to have left is deism, belief in the supreme being, Christianity is going to go, Judaism is going to go, you know, Islam is going to go. If you want to believe in a supreme creator God, that's fine. Uh, you know, we're not going to have monarchies anymore. We're not going to have royalty anymore. You know, and, it, and it's very popular at the time. You know, you have the American Revolution just getting underway. The French Revolution's a couple years away. But then, you know, the, the tip off of this is this German aristocrat um, named Adolf Carnegie, who was as mainstream as they come, as this complete straight shooter. He was a Germanic Freemason. He was very interested in the mystical side of the craft. For lack of a better term, he was sort of the de facto leader of Germanic occultism at the time. He joins the Bavarian Illuminati, and this is when they really become popular. He talks a lot of Freemasons into joining. He leaves it a couple years later and, and writes a treatise and basically says, look, I joined this, thinking this was going to be this new firebrand of Freemasonry. He said, don't fall for it. It's just the Jesuits under another name. These guys are all closet Jesuits. You know, you know, and the Illuminati is just a complete Jesuit front. I mean, and this seems to be the case because at the, you know, I mean, it's the only thing that really makes sense because as soon as the Illuminati basically fades off the history pages, you know, at the end of the wars of Napoleon, oh, the Jesuits are restored and bang, the Illuminati disappears. So, you know, it was almost like it was just a vehicle um, to carry the Jesuits till after the wars of Napoleon when, you know, the Jesuits are finally restored. At this exact same moment, you know, the Illuminati disappears. Very convenient. Yeah, very convenient. Yeah. Well, hey, I know we've got about probably 
10 minutes before the break. So one thing I wanted to change gears on a little bit, and, and you mentioned it, was I wanted to talk about this idea. And I, and I know that you've said that it's uh, that it's controversial, but that's what my show is all about. So mm -hmm. um, we've got to talk about this idea of solar religions and solar deities. Sure. And and the first thing I would ask you, have you seen um, – have you seen a film called Zeitgeist? Yes, I have. What What do you think of the first third of that film? Is that a decent representation of this idea, or is it completely watered down, or what? It's a decent representation, but the, they make it too simple. If it was that simple, it would have been it would have been it would have been out er, earlier. The, the work that that first part comes from the works, and I'm going to completely butcher butcher her pen name. It's it, she has two <laughs> of her books. Two of her books are in my bibliography. Her name is Ashara S. Okay. Um, her her real name is D. M. Murdoch. Okay. Um, and 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 a lot of that is based on on that, and and, and it's a lot of based on Jordan Maxwell as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. They 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 are getting it. Um. Uh, well, I don't want to say. You know, I don't want to certainly say this. I'm criticizing their works. I'm not at all. A lot of this comes from the works of a Freemason named Manly Palmer Hall. Yes. Um, and if you read the secret teachings of all ages, you will see a lot of the material in that first part of that movie or that documentary coming from the works of Manly P. Hall. Um, you know, where you get into the concept of the sun deities, the number 12, which is the 12 houses of the Zodiac. When you get into Christianity, basically, there is some truth to the zeitgeist material. I mean, I talk about it in the Royal Arch of Enoch book with the astrotheological aspects. Mm -hmm. And I, I know I know what, you know, some of your listeners might be thinking, oh, what, what's this have to do with Freemasonry? Well, the A reason lot. is, is, yeah, it's because it's completely paralleled in the Masonic ritual, both in Blue Lodge and High Degree. But yeah, I mean, you know, you know when, when you're getting into Christianity, what you really have is these guys who are creating the religion at the Council of, uh, Council of Nicaea, these guys are all part of these ancient mystery schools. So what they are doing is they're using these mystery schools. They're, they're just picking and choosing portions. It's not you know universal across the board, but you will clearly see elements in Christianity being barred from the Egyptian you know, Osirian cycle. You'll see elements of Mithraism. You'll see elements of Zoroastrianism. You'll see elements of uh, you know, the mysteries of Eleusis. Um, you know, the, the, the whole thing with the Dionysus and, and Bacchus cults, you'll see that turning up in Christianity. You know, these are the gods of wine, you know, Dionysus, you know, this is why Jesus turns the water to wine. Yeah. Um, you know, and you'll see the, you know, whole astrotheological, you know, idea of the solar, the solar deity, you know, whether it's Mithras or Horus, you know, or, or you know, insert, you know, or Sol Invictus. You know, this is you know just renamed Jesus basically mm -hmm. in Christianity. A lot of, a lot of uh, hermetical works in there too. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and 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 you know you know you, it's it's just basically a rebranding of um, you know these ancient pagan these ancient pagan mysteries. Um, you know, which would deal with sun deities. You know, you know the the I mean, with Jesus is the sun. The twelve apostles are the twelve houses of the zodiac that assist the sun on its annual journey. The Virgin Isis becomes the Virgin Mary. You'll see this played out in Mozart's Magic Flute Opera, um, where the villain is the Queen of the Night, who is the Virgin Mary, um, and she's the villain because she's Isis corrupted. She's stolen the attributes of Isis, which is the moon and the stars. This is why she, the Virgin Mary is the Queen of the Night. Um, that's Mozart, you know, paying homage to this <laughs> same same material. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, and, and the whole thing, then you get into, you know, and I get into this in the book with the procession of the equinox, yes. the equinoxes with the Piscean age. So Jesus is the sun god for the age of Pisces, you know, and, and Jesus is just surrounded with fish and water symbology. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that's definitely, um, you know, part of all this. And like I said, it's it's what you'll find is you'll find is paralleled in Freemasonry in the third degree ritual and even in the higher degrees, um, you know, these astrological solar motifs, which are just never ending, um, you know, in the in masonry. But, yeah, I mean, you, you know, I mean, you get into the whole thing with, you know, you know, with Jesus being the son of God with a U, mm -hmm. not an O. Um, you know the, the the whole the whole the, the whole celebrations. You know the Easter is the resurrection of the sun at the vernal equinox. Christmas, December twenty fifth, is three days after the winter solstice. You know when the sun is dead for three days, only to be yes. born. On, yeah, on the twenty fifth. So I mean, you know, you know, you'll see all that in uh, in, in 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 
Christianity coming out of these pagan religions. And again, it's paralleled in the Masonic ritual. Well, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because mm -hmm. obviously to Freemasons, the sun is is your most powerful symbol. Um, mm -hmm. We have things like Venus and Sirius that also have meanings to you guys. I personally have, have long been a student of astrology. I enjoy it. And one of the things that I've enjoyed reading about uh, your book and Freemasonry is just we come at these topics maybe from different areas and different interests. And if you are a person like yourself or Joe or myself who's just interested in, you know, seeking the truth of some sort and you're going back into history, ultimately by hook or by crook, you kind of wind up with these same subjects and they are all kind of interweaved into various uh, ideologies. And so I have enjoyed reading about that. And if I'm cor if I understand correctly, of the seven sciences, astrology is number seven in your craft. Yeah, yeah, I believe that's correct. I, they, it, it, it's astronomy. It, I believe it's astronomy. astronomy. Okay. Right. Yeah, but it's basically astronomy is basically the um, forerunner. Um, it was astrology yes. is the forerunner for astrology. Yeah, correct. you get into the whole um, seven liberal arts and sciences. This is this turns up in the fellow craft degree. This is the second degree where the 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 the, the candidate is instructed to study the seven liberal arts and sciences. This comes out. This is hermetic. Um, this comes out of the royal arts ceremonial and the underlying philosophies. Where, if if, if in the Masonic old charges, um, basically, it's a long story, but I'm going to try to condense it as fast as I can. Basically, when Enoch returns with this wisdom from the demons or the watchers, um, this is what ultimately becomes mathematics in the seven liberal arts and sciences. He catches wind that the flood of Noah is coming. Yes. He, he, he wants to preserve the wisdom, so he builds this underground vault, inscribes the one pillar with the seven liberal arts and sciences, ascribes the other pillar with the mathematical wisdom. The, 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 the flood comes, the vault survives, and in Masonic lore, the, and he places the name of God in between the two pillars, which, when correctly said, restores the wisdom on the knowledge, or restores the wisdom on the pillars, excuse me, in Masonic lore. The mathematical pillar is restored by Pythagoras, and in right. the, the, the liberal arts and science um, pillar is restored by this guy named Hermes Trismegistus, mm -hmm. which is this Hellenistic Egyptian sage god of magic. So, I mean, you know, you know, and of course Hermes is where the word hermetic comes from. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, you, you will see this. This comes into the second degree. This is of extreme importance in the, thir in the royal arts ceremonial. In, in, in this, in, in third degree, the candidate symbolically possesses the name of God and becomes a symbolic Enoch, Pythagoras, Hermes, a citizen king um, in his own right. Um, and th this is of immense importance when you get into the development of the United States um, and Freemasonry as an influence upon it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you will definitely see this material, um, you know, carried forward, this hermetic tradition carried forward, um, you know, f from the Renaissance, you know, into modern day masonry, um, you know, and even further back than that, you know, you get into concepts of Gnosticism, you know, the yeah. Egyptian mysteries, you know, Hermes uh, turns up there. I mean, one of the, you know, he's a th the thrice greatest. It's a combination of three gods. One of them is the Egyptian god Thoth who is the god of magic. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, you're right. I mean, I, I totally agree that, you know, you will clearly see these um, going back in time and being carried forward in, uh, in masonry. One last question before the break, and this one's mm -hmm. going to be kind of awkward, uh, Robert. Uh -huh. um, Go ahead. I, you, you said something on an interview I listened to the other day, and, and I do not disagree with you. Um, you said that the Bible was kind of just one large solar allegory. Right. And so... My next question then becomes, and the book of Enoch was part of the Bible at one point, or, or the Old Testament, is that correct? Well, no, I think I know where you're going with this. The book of Enoch was never part of the Bible, but it definitely influences, uh, it definitely had an influence on the development of the New Testament. Um, a lot of, well, not a lot, the apostles um, uh, you know, quote, quote from the book of Enoch, the whole thing of Jesus being the son of man that comes straight out of the book of Enoch that right. predates the new Testament. Um, I think I, I I'm going to let you ask your question. I think I well, am going to anticipate what you're asking me, but go ahead. Great. So that leaves me with the question then, where does this leave us with Enoch in the book of Enoch? If, if the Bible itself or the new Testament is this silver allegory, um, and not meant to be taken literally, then where does that leave us with Enoch? Well, what it leads you with is, in, in the book of Enoch, again, you have this solar allegory with Enoch being 
um, 365 years on Earth. You have the astronomy gotcha. book where, where he gets into the sun and the moon. I've been asked, I, I've been asked before, why has the Book of Enoch been left out of the Bible? And the answer I give is because if, if, if you understand the Book of Enoch and, it's an, you know, and, it's, and the importance of the astronomy book, you'll see that the New Testament is based upon this. So you know, it's, it's, it's basically the key, that it, the Book of Enoch is the solar key, the astrological key that unlocks the, um, the, the, the New Testament. This is most likely why Raleigh in the history of the world said that Origen had a copy of this thing because um, Origen is, is the, basically the compiler of the New Testament. And Robert, so, I don't mean to cut you off, but we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to the break right now. We'll okay. be, back, we'll be ja back in just a few minutes with Mr. Robert Sullivan. <clears throat> Greetings, truth seekers, paradigm busters, new world order, civil disobedience, freedom fighters, free thinkers, higher mammals, good people of all types. Welcome to the second hour of the Electric Pyramid here on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. My name is Michael Parker. Tonight we are talking um, about Freemasonry. We are speaking with Robert W. Sullivan IV about his new, well, it's not new now, it's been out a year or so, um, this wonderful book, uh, the, the Royal Arch of Enoch, The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism. We still have a lot to cover over the next hour, and we're going to try to um, focus as well on symbolism in films, but I still got to, we've still got to sort out a few things from the last hour. And I know that Joe had a couple of additional questions regarding, regarding, uh, solar religions. Is that correct, Joe? Well, I had been speaking on a similar thing to what you mentioned earlier, Robert, about, uh, the son of God, uh, being the, the son. And it was mentioned to me that that only works in an English translation. And I was, and I was trying to describe or to put it into words w without really being hammered by saying it. I was trying to say that it wasn't really so much the word. It was that the, the sun that God created was physically the sun. And then that was later an attribution to the son of man. And uh, do you, have you met hard criticism uh, specifically when, when dealing with that or has just been sticking to those early teachings just been uh, just private in between the brothers and the lodge? Um, well, uh, what would, when you get into the concept of, of the sun with in the lodge, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Uh, well, no, um, the, 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 the concept of the sun within the lodge. I mean, a lot of Masonic literal literature will tell you that that's, you know, the most important symbol within Freemasonry, um, you know, and of course, you know, you get into the whole religious, you know, overtones with this, you know, with the sun being the light and life of the world, the resurrected savior, um, you know, it, it's, you know, kind of what we were talking about, you know, with a play on words with the sun, with the you, with the yo, um, you know, and a lot of the, um, you know, the, Early church fathers um, talk about this. Uh, it turns up in the book of Matthew. It turns up in the book of Enoch. How the the the, the son of man comes out of the east. Uh, you know, same sort of thing. It's the rising sun within the lodge itself, within Blue Lodge um, masonry, within the Blue Lodge system. The the entire lodge is based on the sun. Um, you have the worshipful master sitting in the east. As he, that's the guy who rules the lodge. He sits in the east as the rising sun. The junior warden um, sits in the south, and that's the sun in midday or meridian. And then the sun, uh, the senior warden sits in the west, or the setting sun. Um, within the within the third degree ritual, I mean, this is again the, the solar allegory, the death and resurrected sun man. Um, it's the Hiram of Bith, you know, Osirian cycle, you know, duplicated um, or paralleled is probably the better word, or echoed um, in the Blue Lodge where Hiram of Bith is killed. Um, you know, you know, he, 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 he's dead, he's resurrected. Um, you know, this is of course the death and resurrection of the son, you know, in Christianity, it's the death and resurrection of the son, you know, who is Jesus, yeah. um, the son man, I guess is a better way of saying it. Um, you know, and, and even within the blue lodge ritual, I mean, I, I'll just go real quick. 
um, that this is the third degree. I mean, it, it's sort you know, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, you have um, the Hiram Abiff uh, character. Um, you know, he's killed, uh, and when he's killed, his body is buried west of the temple. That mm-hmm. represents death, the setting sun. Um, when he, when he's buried, his body you know, the, the 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 body is concealed with something called a sprig of acacia. That's a flower sacred to the sun god Apollo. Um, when he is resurrected, or when 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 King Solomon finds he's gone missing, he dispatches twelve fellow craft to go look for the body. This is of course the twelve houses of the zodiac who are mm-hmm. gone looking for their last solar, solar ruler. And then when finally Hiram Abiff is resurrected, it's what's called the strong grip of a lion's paw. It's a reference to the constellation Leo, which is the sole house of the sun. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you'll see solar references all over the Blue Lodge uh, from start to finish. You'll see this also carried forward in the higher degrees, and you'll see it turn up at the Royal Arch Ceremonial as well. Well, speaking of the sun, again, let's. I want to move over now to the U.S. because before we move on to the movies at the, in the second hour, we still got to finish up some things. You okay, make sure. you you, and I'm just saying that more for the audience. But you make a great point in the book. I've not heard this phrase before, but I, I I'm I'm convinced that the U.S., the United States of America, is in fact a Masonic republic, and obviously many of our forefathers were masons including george washington and then that that lends itself not just to the writings of the day uh the constitution and and the declaration of independence but in fact the basic layout and architecture again of washington dc and there's been many you know stories about that just when i was doing my research for this show i was thumbing through netflix or amazon or something and uh, the sheer amount of just kind of conspiracy-oriented ideas about the Freemasons and the way things are are laid out in D.C. And then today I was watching a interview with Matt Lauer and uh, Dan Brown. And uh, maybe you can just kind of tell us how how this came about and some of the the better known examples of the Masonic architecture and layout of Washington D.C. So that people can understand what this really is. Right, right, sure. You know, just just to get into a little bit before that, you know, you have also, you know, I do have a chapter called the United States of Freemasonry, yes. right, or, or something to that effect. Where I do present that the United States is basically just a grand Masonic experiment. You've got the triple division of government between the executive, legislature, and Supreme Court. This is paralleling the triple division of government in the Blue Lodge between the Worshipful Master and his two wardens, which is, again, another solar reference. Um, you have the separation of church and state. This comes straight out of Anderson's Constitutions of Freemasonry, where he basically does not require a religious requirement to join uh, a Masonic Lodge. He basically turns, he, he, it's deism. You have to believe in a supreme being, but however you want to get there is up to you. This is clearly the clearly the basis of the uh, Second Amendment, I believe it is, separation of church and state. Um, that comes out of Freemasonry. So just the, the entire governmental system, the triple division, separation, I mean, this is all ideas coming out of the Masonic Lodge. When you get into the architecture of Washington, D.C., you've got to remember that all the guys who are doing this are all Freemasons. Mm-hmm. Um, Law and Font, um, we know, at least took the first degree. Um, in Holland Lodge in New York, this is the lodge that DeWitt Clinton joined. Um, you have um, Latrobe, who is responsible for the Capitol building. He was a Mason. Hoban, who was responsible for the White House, he was a Freemason. Um, Robert Mills, who did the obelisk, he was a Freemason. So, I mean, you have Masonic, Masonic fingerprints all, all over the place with this. Um, it, it's not really conspiratorial at all. No. Um, it's, it's they are just using masonry as their template to nation build. And, and the concept of sacred architecture and having astral alignments, um, this comes out of the world of Hermeticism as well. Um, this comes from Hermes Trismegistus, who I mentioned is very important in masonry and in the higher yes. degree specifically. Um, he carries around this thing called the Emerald Tablet, which has on it the Hermetic Maxim of as above, so below, meaning that if you're going to build a, board, uh, uh, a building to stand the test of time and be important, you're gonna ha- you want to have it aligned to its proper stars in the heaven. It's not demonic at all. It's the exact opposite. Since the stars are closer to God, you're actually symbolically drawing down divinity to your building is the idea behind it. Mm-hmm. So within the federal district, um, 
you have the Capitol building that has the dome on it. That's a solar reference. And again, this is, you know, the sun coming, you know, the reference to the sun, again, coming out of Blue Lodge masonry. Dome buildings are the chamber of the sun god Apollo. This comes from the works of Vitruvius, um, carried forward in the Renaissance by two architectural Renaissance masters, Andre Palladio and um, Leon Alberti. Um, yes. they, 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 they really um, harp on this. They rework Vitruvius's books on architecture. So you have a solar reference with the, 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 the domed capital. You have um, the obelisk, which is a, uh, the Egyptian obelisk, which was sacred to the Egyptian sun god Amun-Re. Um, he's sort of the spiritual esoteric force behind the sun. Um, then you have, of course, the White House, the executive mansion by Hoban. That is based, uh, the architectural design for that is Leinster Palace in Dublin, Ireland, which used to serve as a Masonic Lodge. So, you know, the White House is, you know, where your chief executive, your symbolic, you know, elected, you know, which I say in the book, for, it's a long story, one have time to get into it, but basically as a royal arch son priest is the United yes. States presidency. Um, he resides in your Masonic temple known as the White House. You have those three structures forming a Pythagorean right triangle, the White House to the monument up to the Capitol building, and the hypotenuse would be Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, the Pythagorean theorem or the 47th proposition of Euclid is the emblem of a Masonic worshipful master, it denotes Masonic leadership and rulership. Um, it's also a solar, solar emblem. Um, the, the one side represents the sun god Osiris. The other side is his virgin wife consort Isis, and the hypotenuse is the per perfected sun child Horus. Um, and, you know, you know, you know, the, the hypotenuse is Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the keystone state. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why Pennsylvania is called the keystone. Uh, it comes out of Royal Arch uh, esoteric Freemasonry. Um, you will see astrological alignments um, in, in, in D.C. Um, I know the, the, the Washington Monument is aligned to the Egyptian dog star Sirius. The United States Supreme Court building, the cornerstone, oh, that was laid on October 13th. That's aligning it to the constellation Libra, which is the great scales of justice sure. in the sky. So, you know, you want to invest your Supreme Court building with, with what else but the House of Libra. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm just doing a little bit right, you know, just off, off you know, the collar, but there's a lot more to it. And, um, you know, yeah, you, you will see this um, stuff in Washington, D.C. Um, it's actually, believe it or not, the architecture of Mills and, and um, excuse me, Latrobe is paralleled in Baltimore, Maryland, um, with the Baltimore Basilica and the Baltimore Washington Monument. Um, you, you will see this esoterica with the um, dedication of the Erie Canal, which was done with a royal arts ceremonial. So, you know, um, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the United States is one grand Masonic Republic, uh, grand Masonic experiment. Um, I, I was recently asked on a show, you know, do you, do you think they were doing this on purpose? And I said, yeah, I said, I said, when it comes to the founding fathers, people like Washington, Franklin, you know, it, it, it's 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 they're using Freemasonry to nation build, and and basically they're using the concepts of Masonic governance and turning it into a govern, uh, you know, a a, a governmental system um, for, for rulership. They, they know they knew what they didn't want, and they didn't want a monarchy, and they didn't right. want a Vatican-styled organization where one religion would be exalted over the suppression of others. They knew they knew they didn't want that. So, you know, where else do you turn to? Well, you have Freemasonry, which was very popular in the colonies. Um, you know, it, it welcomed people of all faith. Um, it, it welcomed people of all standing. You could be rich or poor or, or join it. Um, so, you know, this was very popular, and, and, they, and they took the tools of Freemasonry, both Blue Lodge and the higher degrees, and, and basically turned a country into it, you know, made a country out of it, is, for lack of a better word. No, that's true, and I think that I think they did the right thing. That's one of the things that I've enjoyed reading about this the most. Is listen, I mean, if you're into the, some of the the lore out there, you're eventually, or you just watch films, you're originally, are eventually going to get into this idea. Oh my God, there's a pentagram in Washington D.C. and this, that, and the other thing. But when you get the larger picture of what these gentlemen. Being Masons, the information that they were privy to and the organization, the way that it was laid out, I mean, this was the best model that they could have chosen to restructure a nation around at that time. Well, I agree with you, but the problem with it is, is by doing this, there was almost um, the impression. 
they did it, but there was somewhat no transparency with it. Right. So the, pro- the, the, the negative aspect of this is, yeah, it was a good thing, and they thought they were doing great by it, and they were using masonry as this wonderful thing to nation build. The negative thing is it was somewhat done without transparency. So people see it today, they see the architecture, they understand the alignments, and they think this is the evidence of this demonic Freemasonic conspiracy to take over the United States or to take over the world, and that's not at all what these guys were intending. It's the exact opposite. They were just using the tools of Freemasonry to nation build, um, and they're incorporated in their architecture and, and, and you know, excuse me, in the architecture and in the government. But, you know, you know it, it wasn't evidence that the Masons were taking over. It was just a Masonic influence that was being, you know, used to formulate this new nation. Um, but unfortunately, there is people out there, and you know, you know, th- that will just tell you over and over again that you know this is demonic, you know, and, and this is evidence of this vast conspiracy which these guys never intended. Um, I mean, I mean, now I'm not going to come on here and sound like a total apologist. Was there, you know, elements of masonry, you know, working over state lines, formulating policies behind door closed doors, you know, hinges, you know, you know, you know, you know, influence of, you know, even the Illuminati? Yes, there were. Um, you know, this is clearly going on with a man named DeWitt Clinton, who basically picks up the Masonic mantle after George Washington dies. I mean, he is using masonry in the higher degrees to formulate policy behind closed doors um, mm-hmm. and over state lines. So, I mean, this was going on. I mean, let's make no mistake. But, um, you know, these guys would have seen this as a positive, um, not a negative. To, to DeWitt Clinton, this would have been a way for the he, – he, he hangs around with Federalists, but he's a Jeffersonian Republican. But he would have seen masonry as a tool – to basically, um, you know, for, for political factions to come together and work for the betterment of the common good, not not as some sort of overarching conspiracy to control people or anything like that. Right. And but then in the 1820s, I believe is when it was you guys got some really strong pushback. It was the, the Madison affair. The William Morgan affair. William Morgan affair. Yeah, that's right. What happened, the, the, the way Clinton ties directly to this. Um, what happened was a, a, a man named William Morgan in Batavia, New York, um, he was a publisher. Um, he claimed to be a Mason. This probably was a lie. If, 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 if he was a Mason, he may have tricked his way into Masonry, but it's beside the point, really. Um, he was threatening to expose a lot of the Masonic secrets, handshakes, passwords, you know, secret names, things like that. That didn't go over well. Make a long story short, he was um, arrested on a trumped-up charge. He was taken across the border into Canada and was disposed of, to say kindly, I mean, he was killed. Um, the, the Masons who did it were, were put on trial in a kangaroo court. The jury was Masons. The judge, well, judge was a Mason. DeWitt Clinton got involved. Um, the guys went scot-free. And there was this huge uh, Masonic backlash in the country where Masonry was once viewed as this patriotic order of Washington and Franklin was now looked at looked upon as this conspiratorial um, organization. People then all of a sudden began, you know, suddenly began to believe that maybe the Illuminati had really turned up here and had, you know, infiltrated the government. Um, DeWitt, you know, a lot of Masonic lodges closed. DeWitt Clinton dies shortly after the Morgan affair. Um, Masonry survives it, um, but it, 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 in order to survive it, it basically had to completely distance itself with any sort of ideas of, of being an esoteric or, you know, or mystical order. It, it reemerges as a philanthropic and charity organization that just help, helps widows and orphans. Um, mm-hmm. it, 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 any sort of mention of the esoteric just, just is, is distance. You know, it, it, it's thrown away, basically. Masonry survives it, but again, it, it exercises this, you know, the esoteric side, which is basically the version of Freemasonry that survives through the 19th century, 20th century, all the way up until today, which the pendulum seems to be sw- swinging back the other way. Now, you did have the Scottish Rite and the York Rite, which still did have mystical elements to it, but by and large, Blue Lodge Freemasonry, um, it, it survives it, but um, it just emerges as a fraternal philanthropic order, uh, for lack of a better word. And I would argue that it's not just uh, Freemasonry, but but society in general in the 20th century was moving, and I this is unfortunate, was moving away from anything esoteric. And I think that gets back to why now people may view 
masonry mm -hmm. in, in, in these suspect ways, it's because people are so out of out of sorts over thinking about anything in an esoteric form. When our founding fathers were the smartest men in the room back in the day, a lot of these religion and science, it was all you could, you could speak about all of this freely. And if you were going to be a learned illuminated person, you tried to learn as much about as many things as you could. And today I think a lot of that's off the table, unfortunately. And I believe that you're correct in that the pendulum is moving backwards. And I'm, and I'm sure that it's helping, um, Freemasonry get new new blood because I think there are people who are craving and thirsting for this ancient knowledge now, and, and it's about time. I totally agree with you. I know, um, and you know, we talked about this in the first hour that really up until recently, when people were joining Masonry, myself included, now I was interested in the esoteric side of it, but it was more of a passing interest at the time. My real, you know, I, I was always interested in Masonry, Masonry because of my family tradition, but. Um, when I joined, yeah, I mean, it was like I, you know, said it earlier on in the show for family reasons or community service. I know, um, and I know this for a fact, um, and I, I believe this dates to around 2011, 2010, so this was three, four years ago now, that the, um, the Scottish right, the Southern Jurisdiction, which is what I'm in, um, they did a poll, I want to say, of, of um, it's a poll they do, I think, like every five or six years, some, something like that. They, they just do a random poll of, of, of men entering Freemasonry. This is Blue Lodge Freemasonry. This really mm -hmm. isn't the Scottish Rite. And they poll them on why, why they're joining. Um, and, of course, you know, like I said, up until recently, it was, you know, family tradition or community service. But in this poll in 2011, this went the other way. And I think it was something the majority, and I can't remember the number, but it was the majority said that the reason they were joining Masonry was because of its esoteric and occult tradition. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. There is definitely this newfound thirst for this esoteric oh, wisdom. Yeah, and, and that, you know, Masonry, you know, is definitely, um, you know, I mean, I mean, part of this is also in part, I mean, let's be honest, you know, the Internet, the Dan Brown stuff. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, hopefully my book, um, you know, is definitely uh, moving the pendulum yeah. back towards the uh, esoteric I'm side. I'm looking of the for someone to discuss Marsilio Ficino with, but that's not it's not a common topic with people. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe it will be soon. But you you were just giving us the the perfect segue because yes, I I, I tend to agree with you as, as just a observer that certainly the Dan Brown books and and movies and the internet. Um, have given interest in the craft a revitalized energy and i think that's a good reason for us to change over to your your second book now correct me if i'm wrong robert i'm reading that you have actually two uh books on esoteric symbolism in cinema is that correct well uh yeah the well the the um the, the I know you have, no go ahead but i, I know I, what you're gonna well, the final the final chapter of this book deals with the subject, right? But, and then I, and then I know that you have a new book, but I believe I read on your website that there's a, a, even a second one after that coming out. Right, right. The 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 final chapter of Royal Arch deals with the Masonic and Enochian and solar symbolism. Yes. A couple movies, the Cinema Symbolism book. This is my new book. The e-books for this will probably be out in the next five or six days. I'm thinking. Um, I know the paperbacks are on their way. Um, I should have them, you know, I've got to sign some of them. Um, you know, I know, I know some have pre sold sold on this pre-order thing that, uh, I have on my website. So uh, we're looking at around uh, July 10th to the 15th where they'll be out, finally out to the public. Um, this is cinema symbolism. This is my brand new book. That's about to be released literally any day almost. Um, the, the, the cinema symbolism two book, um, this has the Facebook page, um, yes. This is on my website as well, where I have the uh, V for Vendetta guy and, and Mal Malice Maleficent, the cartoon character, as the icon. Yeah, this is a book I'm writing right now. Um, this is a book I'm working on. Um, this book is probably a year away. When, when I did, when I wrote Cinema Symbolism, uh, the book that's about to come out, um, there was more movies I wanted to put in put into it, but I, you know, the book would have just gone on forever. Um, when I when I when I was writing the Cinema Symbolism book. There's a ch they, they come back to back to back. There's a chapter on um, how, do, how does it go? It's it's the the, the the it's the Matrix, the three Matrix movies. Then I did the six Star Wars movie. No, I did the mm -hmm. Star the six Star Wars movies. Then I did the Matrix movies. Then I did the Lord of the Rings movies. I was going to do the seven or eight Harry Potter movies, and I thought no way. 
thought there's no way I, I could possibly do that. So I pulled the Harry Potter stuff out. I, I tease it a little bit in, in cinema symbolism, and I wanted to do some of the C.S. Lewis material. Uh, again, I pulled that out. Um, so wh when I was writing cinema symbolism, um, there were other movies that I really wanted to talk about. Um, but, you know, I, like I said, the book would have just gone on and on and on forever. So right now I'm writing Cinema Symbolism 2. Um, this will probably be out in uh, probably another year. Um, but Cinema Symbolism 1, um, that'll be out, like I said, in the next uh, two, two weeks at the absolute latest. The e-books, the, e uh, the Kindle and the Nook versions will probably be live um, probably before the 4th of July, I would think. Excellent. We're going to give out all the uh, the links to, to, to get the books um later in the show, because I, I want people to take a look at this. I do not have a copy of Cinema Symbolism 1, um, so I'm going to have to kind of wing it. I've, I've read por portion yeah. of the well, chapter. I, I, I hope you don't have it, because it's yeah. not out yet. Right. Yeah. right. So, but, but here's the deal. I've listened to you talk about it quite a bit, so let's talk about some of these films, and, and I, I guess one of the things that I'm wondering, if, if there's symbolism in these films that is is Masonic, then it must be being put in there intentionally, correct? Well, right. Um, there's two ways. There's two ways. There's a couple ways of looking at this. Um, right. One is one is it's intentional, which I believe it is in a lot of cases. If there if it is not intentional, and I can think of a couple examples where it is not intentional, you are clearly dealing with um, what is called the collective unconscious of Carl mm -hmm. Gustav Jung, where yes. the material is appearing. Because it's so ingrained in our subconscious, things like mythology, the zodiac, the solar lore. This comes also out of the works of Joseph Campbell. Exactly. Um, that, that, that it's appearing there because we just can't help ourselves, for lack of a better word. There, there are some instances where, I mean, I know it's there. Um, and, you know, it, it gets into, and I've been asked this before, well, why are they putting it in there? Well, what it's doing is it's turning the movie into this great myth. And, and basically, it's um, you know it, it's revealing what the, the mythology and, 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 and the lore that these movies are based upon, um, you know you know by putting these little clues and symbols in to the movies, um, and, and and also you know it, you mentioned this before, um, you know it, it's it's a challenge almost you know that I think these filmmakers like to challenge their audiences. I mean, Darren Aronofsky does this ad nauseum in Black Swan, um, with these little clues that he puts in there. Um, that, you know, will really, you know, tip you off when you understand the underlying, you know, symbology of what's going on. You'll see it in the Excalibur movie. This is, that's a movie I talk about in the, um, in Royal Arch of Enoch. Um, that's a solar, you know, the King Arthur legend is sure. a solar allegory from start to finish. And, and, and the best presentation of the so solar allegory is the Excalibur movie that came out in the late seventies, early eighties, um, by John Borman, um, the, the, some of the other movies in the Royal Arch was like The Ninth Gate, which is Kabbalah. The Being There movie with Peter Sellers, which is a solar allegory. Um, the, nat the two National Treasure movies, which are very Masonic. The first National Treasure movie is a retelling of the Royal Arch ceremonial. The recovery of the, the, the Masonic treasure vault underneath the Holy Ground. Um, and, you know, when I was writing Royal Arch, you know, I, I, I you know, kind of... Um, Tease the, these movies, these these Hollywood movies with this Masonic symbolism in it, but there was so many more subject matters and you know movies I wanted to talk about, but really didn't fit in. So that's where cinema symbolism was born out of, was born out of this last chapter. And um, you know, cinema symbolism, I talk about movies like The Exorcist, um, the Back to the Future trilogies, the Star Wars, the Matrix. Um, some horror movies. I get into some of the mythology of like Dracula. The Werewolf, Frankenstein's Monster, which is a Kabbalistic golem, um, mm -hmm. and th things like that. I get into some TV symbolism with the X Files. There's some unique things going on there. Um, and let's talk about the let's, let's ahead, talk I'm about sorry. the X Files for a second. I enjoyed that show. Um, hit me with some examples. Well, I know I know there's the one that was always one of my favorites um, in the X Files was, and I think it's a second it's a second series episode. It has a German title called The Hand That Wounds, and this was the one that takes place at this high school where the students are practicing the Goetia, the Ars Goetia, mm -hmm. Solomonic magic to summon the demons. 
and the substitute teacher shows up who's the devil or, or this high ranking demon. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a scene in it where, where, where Mulder and Scully are standing in front of the high school. And in the background, you can see the name of the high school and the name of the high school is Crowley high. I thought <laughs> that was really clever. Um, mm -hmm. obviously an homage to Alistair Crowley. Um, that was always one of my favorite ones. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I'd have to go back through the X Files again, but you know, you'll see little things like that. And of course, the whole thing with the, uh, you know, you know, you know, the X Files. You know, I mean, it's not even really hidden symbolism. You know, with the whole thing with the, you know, government conspiracy, sure. and the UFOs, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I always like that one with the uh, Crowley High School in the background. I thought that was really clever. Uh, I talk about that one in the book. Um, they had a, yeah, they had an yeah. they had an episode with a golem in it as well, I believe. Yeah, um, I, I think I think that's right. Uh, there, there was one. I know that on the, this one show on Fox right now, which also did the X Files. I want to say the show called Sleepy Hollow. They sure. had a go they had a golem in it, um, and this comes from the world of uh, Kabbalah. Uh, you know, the creation of um, you know, uh, in, in, you know, in, imbuing life into in, in inanimate ob object. So, you know, it's Kabbalistic magic. I guess the most uh, famous Kabbalistic golem. Um, in history is probably Frankenstein's monster. Mm -hmm. um, what, what another Kabbalistic golem, this will floor you. Um, probably the most second famous Kabbalistic golem in, um, in, 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 in uh, entertainment history is Smurfette. Is, um, a Kab yeah, is a Kabbalistic golem. She is a lump of clay that uh, Gargamel uses black magic to create to uh, undermine the Smurf's uh, little perfect communist society there um yeah you know yeah the the, the smurfs are uh Car papa smurf is Karl marx by the way this is why he wears the red phrygian hat the right. smurfs are the communist society they all work without pay and live rent free but they all do their own chores you know as little yeah. communists would um and you know the <laughs> you know the, the papa smurf wears the red costume you know of the red communists and things like that i've never i've never wanted I've never wanted yeah. to see that film until now, man. It's like, oh, I, yeah, I'm not, yeah. now, now I want to see it. That's really amusing. I love it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You'll see some some weird stuff with uh, cartoons. And I know I was talking with Joe about Disney uh, before. So, you know, yeah, you'll, uh, you'll yeah. see yeah, you'll see some stuff with uh, the cartoons and Disney and things like that. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, you know, you get, you, you know, when, when you get a symbolic eye for this stuff, you'll really start to see these mystical uh, elements um, turn up in, uh, you know, popular movies and uh you know you know the list is endless almost uh you know matrix has gnosticism in it the star wars movies is you know a lot of solar allegory in that sure. um you know well, you know go ahead let me let me ask you about the james bond series because i've heard oh, yeah. you talk a little god I, I, yeah. I totally did not see this coming but let's let's talk about that a little bit and and ian fleming as well Oh yeah, that's a great subject matter. Um, yeah, the uh, Ian Fleming was in British intelligence during World War II and was a well, his he was the handler for Aleister Crowley. Aleister that Crowley blows was my in, mind. Yeah, Aleister Crowley was a British agent for the uh, English during World War II, um, and this is a true story. When um, a lot of people aren't aware of this, when 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 Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy, flew to England on the botched peace mis mission. Hess, Hess was into astrology. A lot of the higher-ranking Nazis were mm -hmm. into mysticism and the occult and things like that. Um, when Hess flew to England, um, they captured him and they put him in the Tower of London. Uh, this is a true story. Alistair Crawley went to Ian Fleming and said, listen, let me I interrogate this guy. He said, you know, I'll perform some black magic sorcery. I'll do some Goetia magic in, you know, in front of this guy. You know, we'll scare the living hell out of him. And, um, you know, you know, we'll, we'll use, we'll use this to threaten him to reveal, you know, like Hitler's astrological proclivities. Himmler was into this material as well. So was Joseph mm -hmm. Goebbels, the, the propaganda minister. Um, and Crowley went to Fleming with this. Um, and ap apparently Fleming went to higher ups, um, w w with this idea. It was ultimately vetoed. Um, it, it, it never came to fruition, but yeah, um, Fleming was Crowley's handler. Um, and yeah, the James the James Bond stuff has all kind of esoteric imagery in it. The the zero zero seven sigil um, that's Bond 007, That's John D. Um, when D would write these espionage uh, letters to Queen Elizabeth, he would sign them zero zero seven. 
and the, the, the it's a it's a spy glass. It's little eyeglasses mm-hmm. is what he was trying to draw, and the, the symbol was representing that the correspondence was for her eyes only, which is where that term comes from sure. for your eyes only. And of course, uh, Fleming would have been aware of D through Crowley and um, imbues Bond with uh, the the whole uh, 007. It's an esoteric homage to Dr. John D. And and the the James Bond uh, you know novels and you know their their subsequent movies are um, you know replete with uh, alchemical Rosicrucian Gnostic uh, ideas where you know but Bond Bond is sort of the solar hero. Mm-hmm. Um, he gets he gets the mission from his solar ruler M. Uh, M is the thirteenth letter of the alphabet. You know, and this mm-hmm. denotes the sun ruling the zodiac. So then, you know, the sun sends Bond to Hermes Trismegistus, who is Q, the right. little quartermaster guy, to give him the sacred wisdom or the gadget that ultimately saves Bond's life. Then Bond will always encounter the sacred feminine, who is the Bond girl. That yes. once he hooks up with her, you know, the alchemical <laughs> wedding occurs, and now Bond can go on and defeat the Gnostic demiurge like supervillain, who is the alchemist Goldfinger, the dragon Hugo Drax the voodoo occultist Mr. Big, or the Illuminati, you know, uh, Blofeld who wants to take over the world. So, yeah, you'll, you'll see the, um, you know, in Goldfinger, you have, uh, what is it, he has the little, uh, you know, out of all, you, there's a lot of, al- alchemy is a real big popular subject matter in Hollywood. Well, sure. When I say that is, um, you will have movies that are alchemically themed that don't actually deal with people trying to turn base metal into gold, but will deal with transmutation of some kind. Exactly, yes. Um, and, and, but in Goldfinger, you actually have an alchemical movie where he has the philosopher Stone, Goldfinger, that is, who, mm-hmm. who, who, which is the nuclear dirty bomb, which is going to transmute the gold in Fort Knox and make it worthless while alchemically making his gold supply, what would he see, 10 times more valuable than the gold in Fort Knox, so collapsing the Western economy. And, of course, the name Goldfinger, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the alchemist who was able to turn the, you know, transmuted was said to have the golden finger, you know, you know mm-hmm. the magical finger, the golden touch, as it were. And Go- Goldfinger's first name is Auric, and AU is the alchemical symbol, yeah, for gold. Yes. So, yeah, you know, you'll see all that in that. Um, yeah, James Bond has, uh, you know, James Bond has some great, great stuff in it. You know, the, the whole thing with Fleming, with uh, you have the voodoo aspect with, uh, that's the Live and Let Die movie yes. with the tarot cards. Um, you know, and you, you, if, if you watch the movie, uh, I, I talk about it more in detail in the book and the information's not in front of me. But if you pay attention to the tarot cards that she's flipping over and some of the th- ones you'll see on her desk, it's anticipating things that are coming in the movie um, and, and little clues that are going on in the movie. Um, so yeah, you'll see that in there. A lot of the, and this is really isn't, you know, esoteric, but a lot of the, um, and some of it is, some of it's a little concealed, but obviously all the female Bond girls have these, you know, very, you know, uh, overt sexual names you know, denoting yes. the sacred feminine, yes. um, you know, and, and Fleming would have been aware of that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, James, I have a whole chapter on the James Bond stuff. It's it's fabulous material. Tell me about The Wizard of Oz. Oh, well, yeah, that's another good one. This is um, L. Frank Baum, um, who was a member of the uh, Madame Blavatsky um, Theosophy ah. Society. And, and, and you, have, you have really three levels of symbology going on in The Wizard of Oz, what well, you have one that's the you know just the base one that's about this little girl who gets whisked away in a tornado and goes to this magical land has this adventure and you know comes back to comes back changed to to her home and that's the end of it this is sort of what you would just call your base explanation then you have mm-hmm. two other hidden allegories going on one's a little more well known than the other one the first one is the political allegory um it's a long story but you have the entire Wizard of Oz um, uh, 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 characters and the thing, or the theme of the movie is a lot of uh, what was going on in the political, socio-economic culture of um, the late 19th, early 20th century United States, where you have things like the Dust Bowl. Um, or, I'm sorry, the Dust Bowl. I'm not sure. I, I, the, the, no, no, you have where when 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 she gets to Oz. Um, it, the, 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 the Wizard of Oz, the, the guy, the, the actual Wizard of Oz is President William McKinley, 
um, and what the, the gold, the, the yellow brick road is the gold standard. Um, oh. And what, McKin- what McKinley was trying to do was get the gold standard to back paper money or greenbacks. Mm-hmm. This is why he lives in the Emerald City, which is yes. green money. Um, in the book, her slippers are silver, not ruby. And this represents what's called the free silver movement, which was very popular amongst farmers, where um, it was had to do with the printing or the coinage of silver money, um, which was going to have the same effect on paper money. And, you know, you, the, the, the scarecrow would be the American farmer who would have been in favor of the free silver movement. The tin man um, is the American laborer. And the, 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 the whole thing going on with the tin man is that he can't move. This is sim- symbolizing the Depression of 1896, where mm-hmm. a lot of laborers were laid off and, and found themselves out of work and basically found themselves, you know, completely, you know, in a stagnant position. This is why when Dorothy encounters Tin Man, he can't move because he's stagnant. What got the laborers back to work was J.P. Morgan's oil, the, the oil companies. This is why in order to get Tin Man moving again, you got to oil him. Um, it, this is just a complete political gotcha. allegory. The, the cowardly lion is Eugene Debs or William Jennings Bryant, who is McKinley's um, uh, sort of um, uh, political opponent who had the loud bark and the loud you know, roar but no political bite. That's why he was a mm-hmm. cowardly lion. Um, the Wizard of Oz is McKinley, who lives in the, the Green Emerald City. The negative aspect of paper money is inflation. This is why the witch, the wicked witch, is green-skinned. Um, representing the darker side of green money. Um, this is the whole, there's much more to it than this. Um, you, I'm just paraphrasing because, you know, because sure. uh, of time. Well, but then you also have, on another level, you have the a whole Gnostic initiation um, uh, uh, story where Dorothy is taking aw- taken away on the winding staircase up the tornado, up the ladder of initiation. This is the tornado. This is the winding staircase in Freemasonry where she's taken to the magical land. This is the spiritual realm in color where she's left the material world behind, you know, of, of Kansas. And, you know, you're getting into the whole thing of the initiatic experience, navigating the ancient mysteries, which Madame Blavatsky said, in order to do this, you had to have intelligence, fortitude, and courage. This is why the three comrades are after a brain, a heart, and you know, cur- you know, uh, uh, you know, fortitude or courage. Um, mm-hmm. The the golden path is the golden path of initiation. This comes out of Buddhism, that leads to the demiurge, which seems to be a legitimate messiah, but always turns out to be you know bogus. Um, this is the Wizard of Oz, who of course turns out to be just basically a humbug. Um, right. So yeah, you have you have a lot going on. Um, allegorical, allegorically with this whole concept of spiritual initiation, um, you know, being wary of organized religions, that the, that the golden path of religion leads to a bogus messiah, basically. <laughs> um, you have in the book, it's more in the book than it is in the movie, where um, the, the, two, the, two wi- the two witches who use the white magic are of the north and south, and this is symbolizing Gnostic ascension and apotheosis, because in order to achieve this, you have to move up and down on the ladder of ascension, where you have the two women who use the black magic, they're of the east and west, that represents stagnation because you can't achieve ascension by moving left and right. So, so, so Dorothy is battling the, the, the two negative women where the one gets killed right away. The two negative witches are of the east and west representing spiritual stagnation and, and lack of ascensio or lack of apotheosis where the two white magicians of uh, the north and south, this is the one who turns up in the movie is Glinda um, played by Billy Burke who by the way has a uh, wand tipped with the pentagram with the one point mm-hmm. up and the two points down identifying, identifying her as a white cabalistic magician. Um, you know, they're of the north and south, symbolizing Dorothy's spiritual ascensio, um, which she ultimately achieves um, by learning the truth within herself that there is no place like home. She tips her, clicks the heels three times, 
you know, this, the number three, I mean, I could go on and on about that, well, you know, and then she gets back home and no one understands her because she's initiated and, no one, you know, you know, they're, they're the profane. They don't understand what she's gone through basically. Well, let me ask you this. Let me, let me flip it a little bit now, because mm -hmm. basically everything that you're explaining now all makes sense to me. And it all comes from people who did this intentionally knowing what they were trying to convey. Now I would ask you, do you believe that some popular artists at this point are taking symbols of Freemasonry and other esoteric uh, ideologies and just using them for shock value? For example. Yeah, yes, I do. Well, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. For, for example, I mean, here, here's how absurd it is. And maybe it's not absurd. Maybe I just don't know. But a few years ago, there was much to do about the Kardashians having a Christmas card with the checkerboard floor. And then you have, you know, a couple of years ago, we had Madonna doing a, uh, a Super Bowl that had a lot of bizarre imagery in it. And then right. you have people like Jay-Z yeah, or, right. or Lady Gaga, Lady Gaga. And, and I'm not picking on these people, but I... My thought is these people are not really vested in this. They are doing it just for the theatrical rise that it gets out of people. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they are actually involved in some level. But what do you think? No, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I was I, I was just on someone talking about this. You know, it was the Madonna Super Bowl thing where she was yes. dressed up as the go to Mendes. Yes. Um, you've got the Katy Perry now video where she's the Egyptian goddess. Yes. Um, you've got Beyonce doing the eye in the triangle thing with Jay-Z doing it as well. Um, my, my take, there, there is two thoughts on this that, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with your take on it. There's a thought process that these people are involved with some sort of Hollywood witchcraft, Illuminati, satanic cult, and that this is evidence of this. I see it the other way. And I see it your way. I think people in their production team, their managers, their stage designers are familiar with this esoteric material to a certain level. Probably yeah. not, probably, I wouldn't call these people masters, but they know enough about it that, you know, they're incorporating it into the stage performances. And my attitude is, you, you know, you know, people say, well, what's the motivation for this? Well, the motivation is it gets people talking about it like you and I are doing right now. That's right. And it gets exactly. chat rooms going. And there's no such thing as bad press. You know, calling yes. Katy Perry an Illuminati witch, you know, well, I'm sure she's crying all the way to the bank on that one. You That's know, right. and, you know, it's, it's, I agree with you. It's shock value. I believe it is intentional to some extent, but I don't see it as evidence as that, you know, you know, that, you know, th th I know because I've seen videos that this is evidence of this Illuminati, Antichrist, uh, you know, you know, devil worshiping cult in Hollywood. I th I see it the way you see it, that it's that people in their in their production design team, their stage managers, their public, you know, publicists see this material. They know it's popular. I mean, look, these people can do Internet searches, too, for God's sake. Exactly. You yes. know, you know, and and and. Um, you know, are, I, I think it's in, intentional, but I think it's like you said, I think it's more being an agent provocateur than it yes. is, you know, you know, being evidence of this demonic conspiracy in Hollywood. I, I agree with you. That, that's the way I see it, too. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I don't bring up the subject too often, but I mean, every time I see that and listen, you know, I, I've read the sites where they say, <laughs> oh, my God, did you see what Lady Gaga did? She did this or that or the other thing. And and to me, I, I just thought, you know what? These are these are smart people. They didn't get to these positions by being dummies. And they also are probably clever people that that have curiosities like we do. Um, oh, right, yeah. And, and, and so it does not surprise me that they would look into these things and, go, and then think to themselves, you know what, how edgy would it be if I dress up like this or I perform against this particular background, you know, and then people can, people that actually don't know that much about the subject anyway, they only see the symbols, they only hear the talk. So I, I, I'm glad to hear that, that you think the same thing. But it's, I think that too. But let's let's not forget also. You know, this predates Jay Z, Beyonce, and Madonna. This is true. I mean, you, you know, you will see tarot cards on Led Zeppelin albums. That's right. Uh, um, you know, look at the Beatles for God's sakes. You know, you know, I mean, a lot of their album covers are very esoteric. The Sgt. Pepper album has Aleister Crowley on it. Yes. Um, you get you get into the whole thing with the Beatles code with with the whole Paul McCartney being dead dead thing. Right. Um, yes. You know, I mean, you'll find these clues on, on their co uh, covers. I mean, I know they, that's intentionally done. I mean, Abbey Road is the godfather of that. 
you know, we're, with, with the funeral march going on. So, yeah, I mean, it predates, um, you know, it predates Katy Perry and Jay-Z. You know, gotcha. I mean, the Rolling, the Rolling Stones, you know, you, you'll find sure. it, you know, you know, you'll find it in their albums and in their songs, too. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's definitely, you know, a, a tool. I mean, my God, you know, you really want to go back, look at Mozart's Magic Flute. I mean, that's Egyptian and deals with a lot of Illuminati initiatic themes. So, you know, you'll find it even in Mozart, for God's sakes. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I definitely think it's a, a it's a powerful conduit, but um, I'm kind of with you. I'm not. I'm not ready to ascribe this really dark, sinister motive behind it that a lot of people are. Well, you also completely anticipated my thoughts earlier because I, I was going to 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 ask you, like, at what point did these types of symbols, and you totally anticipated, you know, at what point is this Carl Jung? At what point is this uh, Joseph Campbell? And we're talking about the hero's journey and things like that. Um, so. I, you know, there's all of these various types of symbols that that are out there that mean certain things to certain people. But um, give us give us more info, like with uh, with Neo and and the Matrix. And I, I I assume he is the the solar deity, Neo. Right. Absolutely. Um, the, the 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 Star Wars, the Matrix movies, and the Lord of the Rings deal a lot with Campbell's monomyth. The the, the whole thing with Carl Gustav Jung. It's, it's basically, it's, it's a way with the collective unconscious, it's a way of saying, basically, if you don't want to believe the materials intentionally put there, it's, it's kind of like an outlet of saying, well, it's there because it's there, you know, because the, we can't help ourselves. We put it there whether we know it or not. I mean, like, you know, I'll get to the matrix in a minute. Like, for example, I mean, I'll give you a prime example. It's one of the best ones I can think of that has a Gnostic demiurge in the movie where I know for a fact that the director of the movie had no clue what a Gnostic demiurge is, you know, the lesser creator God. Um, it's the Ed Wood movie. It's the Ed Wood movie, Glenn or Glenda. Ed Wood was this B movie Hollywood director. Yes. Um, it's a Johnny Depp they, film. They, well, the, the Johnny Depp movie is a biography of the real Ed Wood. Mm -hmm. um, Ed Wood, Ed Wood in the early 1950s made this movie with Bella Lugosi called Glenn or Glenda. It's, for lack of a better word, a 65-minute apologia for transvestism. <laughs> but um, he, get, he, he cast Bela Lugosi as the demiurge, who's this lesser creator god who pulls the strings and manipulates huma humanity for materialistic ends. If you had gone back in time and said to Ed Wood, hey, why did you cast Bela Lugosi as the demiurge? He wouldn't know what the hell you were talking about. But, but there it is. I mean, it's, and it's one of the best examples I talk about in the book. I get it. It, is by, it is by far and away one of the best examples of a Gnostic demiurge in a movie. Getting to the Matrix, I mean, this is just Manichaean Gnosticism from start to finish. finish. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Neo Anderson is the, you know, or James Anderson. Neo is the, da, 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 is the sun god who is dead mm -hmm. and resurrected by Trinity. Oh, my God, you know, there's a death yes. giveaway on her name. Yeah. You have the Hermes Trismegistus character in... in in, in this, this is Morpheus, who, you know, he, the, the Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus character is the old gray beard. He's kind of easy mm -hmm. to spot. It's the guy who knows everything, but is the, the, the divulges is the material piecemeal. Morpheus, Gandalf the Gray, Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, Albus Dumbledore are all Hermes Trismegistus. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Neo is the dead and resurrected Sun Man who has his Sophia, his Gnostic Sophia, who's Trinity. This comes out of the Nag Hammani Library, where the Holy Trinity identifies Sophia as one of the uh, uh, as as a comp component of the Holy Trinity. Um, the the I, I don't have the quote in front of me, um, but the the w when Neo is brought aboard the the ship, the Nebuchadnezzar, you get a flash of the 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 the, space, the hovercraft's nameplate and it says mark it's mark 311 if you look up that bible verse it says all you know something like all the evil spirits will bow down before the son of god which is neo and the you know mm -hmm. the, the 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 evil spirits are of course the robots or the the machines you have in in the matrix in the whole series you have the you know the, the you have your demiurge your your creator of the false world who is the architect he shows up in part two. The archons are the agents. This is his henchmen. This is all Gnosticism. Um, and Neo, again, is dead and resurrected by Trinity. He gets killed. He gets reborn. Um, oh, and then what's he do at the end of the Matrix? He ascends into heaven like Jesus. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, you'll, you'll see. I mean, there's a lot more to it. 
Um, I'm just going over it very briefly. But yeah, all, all three of the um, not, uh, all three of the Matrix movies um, are very Gnostic. I mean, in in in, in part two of the in part two, uh, the second the second Matrix movies, one of the ships is called the Gnosis. I mean, you know, come, yes. come on. I and mean, the other ship is called yeah. the Logos. I mean, you know, <laughs> how, how more obvious yeah. can you get? Um, right. Yeah, and and um, the, what you will also see in the Matrix films in the three Matrix movies is. Uh, is elements of Campbell's monomyth, um, and you'll find that in Star Wars. You'll find that in Lord of the Rings. You'll find it in Harry Potter as well. Um, you know, I get into that. It's the whole monomyth thing with Joseph Campbell, the, the hero's journey, um, mm -hmm. which is basically a soul. Again, you know, it, yes, it, 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 yeah. If the hero is the sun, then the monomyth is the solar journey, for lack of a better word. I get it. Well, I tell you what, we're we're coming close to the end here. I wanted everybody to be able to get your uh, websites. And you guys, if you want to learn more about Robert W. Sullivan, um, one of his websites, his primary website, is Robert W. Sullivan IV for the fourth dot com. So Robert W. Sullivan IV dot com. And his Twitter uh, handle is RSW four T H. He's RWS, got uh, RWS. That's hard. Sorry, uh, RWS for TH. And uh, I was going to let you give uh, the rest of your sites because I know that you've got numerous Facebook accounts and any other sites that we could give out to folks. Well, first off, let me thank you, Mike, uh, for having me on the Electric Pyramid. I sincerely well, appreciate it. I thought it was a fantastic show. Yeah, I did too. I thought it was phenomenal, and I'd love to come back one again, maybe one time. Oh, you got it. You know, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll do some more movie stuff, and when maybe when CS2 comes out or. You know, we get closer to that or some more movie stuff. We can certainly uh, talk about that. Yeah, my primary site is robertwsullivaniv.com. Um, there's links there to all my social media, links to buy the book. Um, you can pre-order Cinema Symbolism. Like I said, that'll be out very shortly. The e-books will probably be launched in the next week. The um, paperback will sh should be out. I mean, well, sh no, should be out. It will be out in two weeks. Um, I got to get some copies to sign, though. So, you know, until that happens, then it'll go out. Um, my Twitter feed is RWS4TH. Um, if you go to R Robert W. Sullivan IV, there's you know links to my YouTube channel, my Facebook like pages. Um, I have a couple of them. The Royal Arch one is, is Facebook forward slash the Royal Arch of Enoch, all connected, all lowercase. Uh, Cinema Symbolism is just that Facebook forward slash Cinema Symbolism. There's links there um, on RobertWSullivanIV.com. There's a YouTube channel. You can check out other podcasts I've done, other videos I've produced. Um, that's youtube.com forward slash Robert W. Sullivan IV. But if you just go to the main site, there's links there to buy the books. If you want the paperback, you can get that. If you want the paperback signed, that's exclusively through my publisher, which is rsplaunchpad.com. Um, but again, there's a link there to my uh, Robert W. Sullivan IV to, to the publisher site. There's the ebook, the Kindle for $9.99. It's on Nook. Um, you can get that at the publisher site. You can get that as Am off of Amazon as well. So check all that out. Like I said, if you just go to Robert W. Sullivan IV, you'll find links to all my social media, Twitter, Google+, Facebook pages. All you want is right there. Robert, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I really enjoyed this, and uh, I, I've been so impressed by your work. I was actually kind of nervous about this show because you have created such a wealth of material in this one book alone, and I admire your scholarship, and uh, you're a gentleman. You're, you're fun to talk to, so I, I just thank you a lot. I appreciate it. Well, I want to thank you, Mike, for having me on. I thought it was a great show. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation. And um, like I said, I'd love to come back and uh, flush out some more Freemasonry and some movie symbolism, too. Well, you're definitely going to come back. By the way, you and I are both Scorpios, and you and I are both Lambda Chi Alphans. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember you said that to me in an email. Yeah, Gettysburg College. I'm, uh, I'm in it was chapter Theta Pi. Yeah, Lambda Chi yes. Alpha and two Scorpios. So, yeah, we definitely got to uh, get together again. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on tonight. And you guys, I want to thank you for listening to The Electric Pyramid. I want to thank Joe Kiernan for producing as well as he always does. And next week, we'll be back with uh, Nolan Green. He is the primary uh, visionary behind The Grassy Knoll, which is a multimedia and musical uh, creation group that's putting out their first record in 20 years. Uh, the week after that, we're going to be speaking to Joe Kiernan about some work that he
Good evening, passengers. We are on our final approach to the electric grid, where your host, Michael Parker, will be joining you shortly. For the remainder of the flight, we ask that you keep your arms and legs inside the craft and your mind open, as we will encounter the turbulence of new ideas and fresh perspectives. If at any time the alternative viewpoints you absorb while inside the pyramid become too distressing, simply say to yourself, I'm happy. It's like a tomb without a roof. Good day. True Seekers, Paradigm Busters, New World Order, Civil Disobedience, Freedom Fighters, Free Thinkers, Higher Mammals, Good People of All Types. How's it going? My name is Michael Parker, and welcome to Episode 5 of The Electric Pyramid, coming to you as always from an undisclosed location somewhere in Hollyweird, California. It is Thursday, June 26th for all of us on the West Coast. It is already Friday the 27th for those of you on the East Coast. And uh, we'd like to say hello to our uh, our producer, Joe Kiernan. How are you doing, brother? Doing well, doing excellent. Everything's fantastic here on the East Coast. How are you doing out there, my man? Uh, not bad. This is uh, this is uh, episode five. We're just, we're just moving right along. How fast was that? I like it. I yeah, like it a lot. Too. See, you guys it's going do, well, man. You're doing you're doing a great job. These shows are fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I'm enjoying it. And uh, you guys, tonight, because of the sheer magnitude of the information that we're going to be diving into, I'm not going to dazzle you with my usual uh, witty antidotes or news stories of the week, because we are going to be talking about something tonight that I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around a lot of just bad information a lot of disinformation and that is freemasonry a lot of people will think uh, if they even think about it at all they're like what what are freemasons is that something out of that dan brown novel or, or is is this is this the illuminati is this the oto are these devil worshipers what what do these people stand for and and what what are they doing and we why are their symbols on our money so it's it's going to be a chance for us to dispel some myths i believe about what the freemasons really are and our speaker tonight is a gentleman named robert w sullivan the fourth and he's written a magnificent piece of work. Uh, this new book is The Royal Arch of Enoch. We're going to be discussing that. I know he was on your show a few weeks ago, Joe. Oh, yeah. I listened to that and uh, it was really great stuff. Yeah, he's uh, he's a uh, scholar and a gentleman, no doubt. Uh, he's uh, well well read, well versed. And, uh, he's, a, he's a student of the craft and, uh, and, and, and I'm grateful for people like him uh, that, that speak out as opposed to just saying, uh, uh, let people think what they want. And he he tries to make a very difficult understanding uh, presentable. He tries to make it presentable, and I think he does a very good job. Yes, I'm reading his book right now. It's it's actually it's one heck of a piece of work here. I mean, this is you know 600, 700 pages. The full title is "The Royal Arch of Enoch: The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism." So we're going to be discussing that for most of the first hour, and then in the second hour, we're going to talk about something that he's also got a new book on, and that is esoteric symbolism in movies. And I'm interested to ask him some questions because. I know from his discussion that I heard him do with you, he addressed a lot of movies that I was actually kind of surprised about. But I want to ask him if popular culture is hijacking some of their symbols out from under them. And uh, so that's just one of the things we're going to be talking about in the second hour. Let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Sullivan. Robert W. Sullivan IV is a philosopher, a historian, an antiquarian, a jurist, a theologian, writer, and a lawyer. The Royal Arch of Enoch is the first published book and is the result of 20 years of research. Mr. Sullivan received his BA from Gettysburg College in 1995, having spent his entire junior year studying European history at St. Catherine's College, Oxford University. He received his JD from Widener University, that's Delaware campus in 2000. He studied international law and jurisprudence at Trinity College, Oxford University. Mr. Sullivan is a Freemason, having joined Amicable St. John's Lodge Number no. 25, Baltimore, Maryland in 1997. 
He became a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason in 1999, Valley of Baltimore, Orient of Maryland. He is a lifelong Marylander and resides in Baltimore. So uh, I think before uh, before we go on any further, let's uh, just try to get Robert on the line. Got a deal. So uh, Robert Sullivan's going to be joining us shortly. Here we go. Oh, hello. Robert? Yes. Greetings. This is Michael Parker with the Electric Pyramid. How are you? I'm very well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Great. Hello, Robert. This is Joe Kiernan. How are you? Uh, hey, Joe. How are you doing? Very well. Nice to hear you again. Yeah, great to be back. Uh, I certainly appreciate the invite for uh, Electric Pyramid. Great to be on. Well, you're welcome. We're glad you were able to stay up late with us tonight. I know this is late for you guys on the on the East Coast, so I appreciate that very much. And Robert, I've got to say, man, I'm reading your book right now. It's a magnificent piece of work, and I'm I'm very impressed. Well, thank you very much. I, I you know, it was 20 years of... Hello? I think we may have lost Robert. Yeah, bear with me here. Ladies and gentlemen, we're working on Skype technology, so sometimes... Things don't go as exactly as planned. I think it's the old mice and men type of thing here, but we will get <laughs> it right back. He might be so, having some storms. I can, I can hear you. Oh. Can you? Oh, you can. I do. Yeah, I'm so